NFL.com's Lance Zierlein has Drake May falling out of the top four picks. We're breaking down all the wild selections from his Mock Draft 1.0 on today's Renner Ranks. This is Renner Ranks, the ultimate NFL ranking show. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into today's episode of Runner Ranks, your go-to daily ranks podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Shout out to the everydayers out there, and do not forget to subscribe, like, follow. It's all free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. I, of course, am Mike Renner, NFL Draft Analyst, and today's podcast brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. That's right, we did DJ's top fifty yesterday. Now we're doing another one of my friend in the draft business, another respected draft analyst, Lance Zierlein of NFL.com. His mock draft 1.0 because it was one of the more one of a kind, shall we say, mock drafts that I've seen so far. Some surprises. And he on Twitter said he does not buy in to what everyone else is saying. This is purely what he's hearing, what he believes. And obviously with the name as respected as Lance Zierlein, I wanted to dive in and get to some of the interesting picks. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Not going to break down the whole mock. If you want to go see that, go to NFL.com and check it out. But if you're watching on the YouTube channel, we are going to go ahead and check it out right here. As you can see on full screen, here we go. All right. And number one, Caleb Williams, the Chicago Bears chalky there. I was, like I said, not going to go through everyone, but number two, Washington Commanders, Jaden Daniels, he has them going. And this one, again, Drake May versus Jaden Daniels, I think they're tremendous prospects. We really, it may not be until draft day until we get an inkling of who the commanders prefer in this scenario. I obviously prefer Drake May in this scenario, but I do think it's an interesting conversation because, one, commander's offensive line is a disaster right now. Daniels, obviously, probably the best athlete of the mix in this class. Zero line even says he's the top, the draft's top dual threat QB. Now I, I would argue Caleb Williams is the draft's top dual threat QB, right? Like Caleb Williams is no slouch as a runner himself, but as a runner, he's de- Daniel's definitely the best running quarterback. The comp I actually have for him is RG three, which, you know, commanders fans, I don't think want to hear, but the build, the accuracy, the mobility, it's very similar. Now, obviously, RG3 failed in the NFL for reasons that I don't think apply to Daniels whatsoever. But I do worry, not just about Jane Daniels, but any quarterback going to Cliff Kingsbury's offense, man. I know there was that whole article about the Dan Quinn, about the head coaching search and how they kind of got left holding their you-know-what at the end of the day by Ben Johnson and Mike McDonald were their top two candidates apparently in the coaching search. But to me, the more damning hire was not the head coach. I think Dan Quinn's a fine head coach to hire. I I don't think he'll be by any means the worst head coaching hire of this session. Right. But Cliff Kingsbury at OC, please point to me, please point to me a good Cliff Kingsbury offense that didn't feature Maybe the greatest quarterback of all time in Patrick Mahomes, right? Like he, he had a Texas a, Tex offense doing diddly poo with Patrick Mahomes at quarterback. He showed no growth over his multiple seasons as the head coach of the Arizona Cardinals. Last year, USC took a massive step forward, step backward, excuse me, offensively with Cliff Kingsbury at the helm. To me, my to, to me, like Cliff Kingsbury is a Hollywood version of what an offensive coordinator is supposed to be. Like he's an actor playing an offensive coordinator. He doesn't, it's all the things you would think of that make a good offensive coordinator, like the style, the flash, the way he is animated on the sidelines, the way he discusses offense, the way he like, you know, passes wide receiver screens, RPOs, all these buzzwords. And then come game time, it doesn't actually matter. The Dolphins is a travesty. That one, I don't mean to go in too much. I, this is a mock draft. But man, if you're the commanders, that one has to hurt. All right. Scroll down a little. 
Arizona Cardinals at number four here. And I love Zierlein's write-ups. They are pithy as can be. He says, the Cardinals need to add a big wideout. My comp for Odense is Larry Fitzgerald. Perfect fit in Arizona. Can't hate on that. And I will say, for all the stuff, you know, on yesterday's episode went in on the Odense versus neighbors conversation. For Arizona specifically, in this scenario, I, I don't hate, I wouldn't hate going Odense over neighbors. They, that's what they need in their offense. They need that outside ball winner. You know, he can do what DeAndre Hopkins did when Kyler Murray was at his best, right? So for them, I don't hate it. But I will say, if you're in this scenario and only two quarterbacks have gone. Marvin Harrison's off the board. Your best case is to trade back if you're the Arizona Cardinals. You have needs everywhere. And to me, the difference between a guy in Roma Dunze, tremendous talent, yeah. But trading back, let's say to pick, you have the Falcons trading up to pick five. You do whatever it takes to let the Falcons trade up to pick four because you would love a Joe Alt who goes number seven in this mock draft. You would love a Malik Neighbors who's still on the board in this mock draft. Like, the difference between them at pick four and even down to like pick 10 is negligible in my eyes in terms of the talent that's going to be on the board, whereas they just need other things elsewhere. And so if someone's going to fall in love with the quarterback and there's a third quarterback on the board, like if Marvin Harrison Jr. has gone in the top three picks like he did in this mock, yeah, I am running in the card for a trade. I'm trying to get whatever I can in return for a trade because – Cardinals just have too many needs to just go with one Roma Dunze. And while I like Roma Dunze, he's going to fit them perfectly. He's not that much bigger of a addition for them than who could be on the board there for pick seven, pick eight, wherever it is that they move down to. So that's my thoughts on that pick. Now he has Drake May going all the way down to number five to the Atlanta Falcons, a dream scenario for them in my eyes. I think a tremendous fit uh, for you know, a lot of I, I've heard comps to him with Matt Stafford. I, I don't think that's the best comp out, but you see it with the different arm angles he can play with. You see it in the arm talent. And obviously you're bringing over a lot of the Ram staff and Raheem Morris as head coach, Zach Robinson as OC to where that one makes a lot of sense for the Atlanta Falcons. So if there is a May slip, I would expect the Falcons to be players to move up and go get them. All right, on to number six, Taliesa Fuaga. This guy's got some fans. OT1 in this mock draft, ahead of Joe Alt, ahead of Olufashanu. Lance Earline writes, Fuaga is one of the finest pass protectors in the draft, and some see him as a guard tackle. He gives the Giants flexibility with where they'll play Evan Neal. I see it maybe a touch differently than Lance. And like if you're talking about moving a guy to guard, I, I, if he was that good of a pass protector, I don't think that would even be in the cards. Now, his arm length was a little on the shorter side. I didn't mention that in the senior bowl review, but he did only have 33 and 3 eighths inch. I say only as if that's short. Like that's well above the cutoff to play tackle in the NFL. If you're moving him into the interior, it's because you don't believe in his athletic traits, right? It's not because of the arm length by any means. So, yeah, I, I don't see that whatsoever. If you're drafting a guy at number six overall, that dude better be a right tackle for you. I'll just say that right now. And, and again, I do think Fuago is a right tackle at the NFL. All right, we'll scroll down to number nine. Chicago Bears and Leak Neighbors. What a dream scenario this would be for them in this mock draft. Going Caleb Williams one, Malik Neighbors nine. It would almost be as much of a dream scenario as trading back from one and still having Jalen Carter on the board. Oh, too soon? No, that was that was a low blow. I just like to make those jokes as I can because I'm a Packers fan. Um, John Carr did tail off down the end of the season, but I think the Bears would still love to have Jalen Carr on that roster. But again, if you had Malik Neighbors and G.J. Moore and Caleb Williams, this is that's as good as it gets, right? Shane Waldron as your OC, there is no excuses there whatsoever. That is an offense built for speed. That would be, again, like I said, as good as it gets for the Chicago Bears. You could not dream up a better scenario than that in this draft. We'll get back to the zero line mock in just a second. But first, today's podcast is brought to you by Robinhood. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood is the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to the IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of Q4, 
one, 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood goal for one year from the date of first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. As 3% matching on transfers is subject to the specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA is available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SBIC is a registered broker dealer. All right, we will go down to one of my... One of the prospects that I just can't get a handle on where he'll actually go come draft day because I don't see him at pick number 12. So the Denver Broncos, J.J. McCarthy is the pick here, the Michigan quarterback, the junior. I haven't discussed him a ton outside of the pure quarterbacks episode that I did a while back. Zero line writes here that McCarthy's processing is as elite, is been described as elite in his conversations with NFL evaluators. And it goes on to say that that's something that obviously Shane, Sean Payton would want at the helm. I don't know if I see it as elite. I, I think his speed with which he processes is, is fast. I don't think he is a just pure decision maker is rivaling on elite at the moment. Obviously only a junior coming out young guy. He'll get knocked for the lack of drop back passes or excuse me for the lack of, you know, passing attempts in that offense. It was a run first offense. Everything ran through their running game, only 370 dropbacks in 15 games, right? That's not a lot of dropbacks. His last six games, he threw for over 150 yards only once. And that was 221 yards against Alabama. So there is not a lot to go off of. But at the same time, all 370 of those dropbacks, there's pretty much no fat on his tape. It is all sort of NFL translatable stuff. So you know, no, no RPOs, no wide screens, no bubbles, no pop passes. There's none of that fake stuff that's gassing up a lot of college quarterbacks numbers. When you watch JJ McCarthy, it is five step, seven step, read the defense, find where you got to go, get it there. You, you know, and so you can evaluate him through that lens. Now, was he elite <laughs> at doing that? I didn't see it. I, I think his biggest detriment, as I've said numerous times, is that the guy does not put touch on the football, whether it's over the middle of the field, whether it's laying it between linebackers and safeties. There's no, there's no second, you know, there's no gap wedge in his bag. It's all stinger four irons going right at, you know, try and throw through linebackers chest and he threw it into linebackers chest probably more than any of the other top quarterbacks in this class because of that. So that's my worry with him. The, the talent is undeniable though. Big arm, light feet, scrambler, playmaker. He'll go in the first round where I, I don't know if it's pick 12. I don't know. Remains to be seen, but I think it's interesting that Lance mocked him there. All right, we're going to go down to pick 16 now. Seattle Seahawks, another type of dream scenario. I just wanted to mention this edge class real quick because Lance has the edge class going off the board a little differently than I do. I have Dallas Turner 1, Layatu Latu 2, Jared verse 3 right now. He has a Jared verse coming off the board 11 to the Vikings, Layatu Latu 14 to the Saints, and then Dallas Turner 16 to the Seahawks. And then, man, that just tells you how loaded this draft is that an athlete like Dallas Turner can realistically be mocked all the way down at 16. You know, if Dallas Turner was in the 2022 draft, there's a chance he goes number one overall. The Trayvon Walker year, he's that talented as an edge. He's that explosive, has that body type that wins. But all the way down at number 16, the Seattle Seahawks, obviously the needs there, obviously a guy that would, uh, be a massive upgrade for them. And with Mike McDonald, they'll probably focus on trying to upgrade that defensive line first. Dream scenario. I don't think it happens in real life, though. I, I think he's too talented to fall that far. Next one, 17, Jacksonville Jaguars. Going Quinion Mitchell, the Toledo corner. This is one I think we're going to see a lot. One, because the Jags need a corner is obvious, specifically in the slot. Two, because Quinion Mitchell is that dude. If you watch the senior bowl recap on the DBs, you'll know that. And then three, because I didn't say this in the senior bowl recap, I met, not met, I saw Tony Khan, the son of Shad Khan, Jaguars owner, down senior bowl, 
talked with him. He was down there with Trent Balky hawking these corners. And if you don't know, Tony went to the same high school as me. That was my pre-existing relationship with him. Had some libations with him at cams back in the day at the U of I. But Tony's still, Tony's still out there scouting, even though he's the AEW czar or whatever it is there. I don't watch much wrestling, but I know he's big into that. But the fit makes too much sense. And Quinion Mitchell I think, is, I think, a guy that could definitely play the slot. He's that physical. Could play on the outside, too. Um, but he's just a darn good corner. And I think the way that Zero Line has the corners coming off the board here, Terry on Arnold 1, Quinion Mitchell 2, is, I think, the way I'm going to see it, is what I would expect it to be at this moment in real life. All right, number 18, Bengals going Olu Fashanu. Number 18, again, Dallas Turner to 16, Olu to 18. I, I would be floored. The The hate going to Olu it just seems a little unworn. I, I, I can't believe the people that are down on this guy's tape. And again, OSU tape was objectively not great. You, you know, that's the game people keep going back to. The rest, though. And again, you're drafting guys for pass protection at offensive tackle. You are not drafting guys for their run blocking ability. And to have JC Latham, to have Olu Fashanu is just, they're not close in terms of pass protection ability, even right now, in my opinion. And so if you're the Cincinnati Bengals, like if you're the Cincinnati Bengals and Olu's making it to like pick 14, pick 15, I'm thinking about trading up for a guy like that. I'm thinking about flipping like a third rounder to get up there, especially in this class where it's not that deep and just saying I'm good at tackle for the first time in since Andrew Whitworth left. So damn, damn, what am I missing here? Someone, someone help me out with Ola. What am I missing here? I will say this. Zero lines write-ups are th this one's I, I I wish I could do this smaller write-up for a mock draft. He just says, Fashanu has good size and length and plenty of upside, but he still has work to do to reach his potential. Man, I, I will say, I'm not saying Zerline does this. I, I, he probably doesn't. But we used to, at PFF, we uh, some editors from ESPN came over. I'm not going to mention names because I don't want to say anything uh, negative coming back to them. But they said when they were at ESPN that they used to ghostwrite the mock drafts for the NFL draft analysts there. Like literally they would just turn in their picks and it would get written up by an editor, which my Lord, I, I can't fathom doing that. I, I promise to you guys, I will never in my life do anything like that. One, because I have too much pride in my own like work that I, I remember I used to get pissed at PFF when my editors would actually like change my words to something somewhat different. I'd go back and read my article and be like, that's not what I wrote. And obviously, you know, that's kind of the job of an editor is to editorialize, but I would be legitimately sending messages to my editors being like, why would you, why'd you change this? Why'd you change that? I liked what I wrote initially. That's why I wrote it. So one, like I, that, but then two, I just, the, the, I would just feel icky. I just would feel icky. We'll get back to the zero line mock in just a second. But first, today's podcast brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. The 2024 Nissan Pathfinder has room up to eight, an expansive cargo capacity, and advanced available 4x4 capability with 208 horsepower. 284 horsepower and up to 6,000 pounds of towing when an adventure calls, the Pathfinder is there to answer. The 2024 Nissan Armada will change the what you expect from a full-size SUV. Picture a rugged 4x4 that can seat up to 8 in first-class luxury and style. Tow bigger and explore further in the 2024 Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Go to shopnissanusa.com. Today's podcast is also brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app 
with over 3 million members. They're the easiest and most exciting way to play DFS. It's just you against the numbers. You pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. Price Picks even offers injury insurance so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and doesn't return in the second, the player projection won't count against you and the rest of your entry stays live. Price Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. Go to pricepicks.com slash NFL and use code LOCKDOWNNFL for a first deposit match of up to $100. That's pricepicks.com slash NFL and code NFL for a first deposit match of up to $100. Price picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Let's get down. Let's get down the board a little to the back end. We haven't touched on the back end of some of these mocks drafts, but this is a few picks here towards the very back end that I wanted to hit on. Number 29, Lions. Darius Robinson, the Missouri defensive end, slash maybe defensive tackle, depending on where you see him. This is a fit that if he's on the board, I can't imagine the Lions passing up on him. One, because he's a Dan Campbell, Aaron Glenn type of football player, right? The guy is a tough, hard-nosed defensive end. Two, because they need a butt kicker on that defensive end. Aiden Hutchinson, with Aiden Hutchinson on one side, you're giving up a little bit in run defense. He's not... He's not a, he's not like a liability in run defense, I'll say. He could still make plays as a run defender, Aiden Hutchinson. But he is not a hard edge setter. He is not a line of scrimmage resetter consistently. Darius Robinson is. That can be your strong side defensive end, a guy that go a long way in terms of that. And then as a pass rusher, he just pushes that quarterback right into Aiden's arms, right? He just collapses his side, bull rushes that side, and then Aiden's going to rack up the sacks on the other side. So, a fit that, again, if he's on the board at 29, I would be very, very surprised if he is not a Detroit Lion. The next one, New England Patriots going Bo Nix, the Oregon quarterback. And let's dive into the strategy here for a second. So number three overall, they're going Marvin Harrison Jr. in this mock draft, passing on the quarterback to then you know, draft, which is still in the first round, a guy you think is your franchise guy, right? If you're taking kicking on the first round, you think he could be that. In most classes, I do not endorse this strategy. If you think a guy's that good, now let's say you have to draft number three overall, Bo Nix, if you think he's that good. There is always a price on everything, and you should stick to that price or stick to the value that you think a guy is. And so if you don't think he's as good as Martin Harris Jr.'s prospect, you don't think he's that caliber, then go Martin Harris Jr., by all means. But... I do think that this class in particular, with how many talented quarterbacks there are, and then how many elite prospects there are at the top, if you really had your sights set on Jane Daniels, say, which is how it went in this mock, and you didn't like Drake May, which I can't see. I, I think the more realistic scenario is really had your sights set on Drake May or Caleb Williams, and didn't love maybe Jane Daniels tape, by all means, don't reach and see if Michael Penix, Bo Nix, is on the board there by the time you're at the wrap in the second round. And I do think with the influx of quarterback talent of late in the NFL, and not necessarily elite quarterback talent, but just I think quarterback 32 in the NFL is a lot better than quarterback 32 was, say, seven years ago in the NFL. I don't think it's the craziest thing to take second and third round quarterbacks and just hope you can get anything out of them, right? Hope if you put enough talent around him, you know, like the San Francisco 49ers doing with Brock Purdy, if you just have enough around this guy, we can make a Super Bowl. Because I do think that guys who are capable of leading NFL offenses are, you know, how binary quarterbacks are getting paid are still kind of being left by the wayside in terms of their valuation that, you know, you kind of saw with Baker Mayfield this past year. He made, you know, 2.5 million, I think was his contract. And he was better than a lot of guys making a lot more money than he was. So I do think there's something to be said for that. So I don't hate it. He's most years... I'm suspect of that strategy, but in this one, and if it is getting M.A. Marvin Harris Jr. and Bo Nix, I would absolutely love it if I'm a New England Patriots. I'm bearing the lead, though, if you're watching the YouTube channels. You can see the next two picks here that we have to touch on both. Two different reasons. 31, Kansas City Chiefs. He has them going Roman Wilson, the Michigan wide receiver. Wide receiver five coming off the board here with... Obviously, the top three of Marvin Harris Jr., Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, 
And then he has Brian Thomas going 28 to the bill. So a big drop off between neighbors at nine, then Thomas Jr. to the bills at 28, which I love that pick, by the way, if that were to be the case. And then Roman Wilson next. I even after a senior bowl and after admitting I was low on him, this seems insane to me. I, I, I would love an explanation for this, especially in this wide receiver class, because the, the tape, like my grade was based off the tape initially and me just thinking like, you know, he's kind of an undersized wide receiver who wins down the field, but that's, you know, not necessarily where a guy with a, that kind of frame, you know, only 5'10", six foot wingspan, you think that's more of an underneath winner, a guy who can win from the slot, usually who's that small. That's usually where those guys end up. Not a guy who's going to go on the outside and kind of, you know, run go balls, right? He didn't even really do that at Michigan either. And then the analytics profile on him, if you're going to go that route, the guy didn't even start until his senior year at Michigan. He had 789 yards in his best season. And yet 12 of his 48 catches did go for touchdowns this past year. That's obviously you know, a plus for the analytics profile. 2.68 yards per out. And then only nine broken tackles in his career on 107 catches per PFF. I just, I would like to hear the case for drafting him over someone like Xavier Worthy from Texas. In, I think they would run similar roles in an offense, right? Your vertical threat, dynamism guys, dynamic route runner types. Worthy, on the other hand, though, he's only 20 years old. Will be only 20 years old on draft day. He had more yards than Roman Wilson did this past fall as a true freshman. Same amount of touchdowns, 12 touchdowns. Same almost identical yards per route as a true freshman. And then obviously developed over a thousand yards this past year. I, I just would be floored. And now maybe it's just like wanting to throw a senior bowl guy in there after the senior bowl. I get it, but man, I, I, I would like, if someone has a strong case for Wilson, please make it in the YouTube comments, please. I need to hear it. Last one, Jatavion Sanders, to the San Francisco 49ers. And I've shared my thoughts on Jatavion Sanders. I don't really want to get into that too much more, but I want to get into the cognitive dissonance the general public has when it comes to tight ends and the kind of evaluation and draft value of these guys. Last season for Texas, their leading receivers were the following. Xavier Worthy, 75 catches, 1,014 yards, five touchdowns. Adonai Mitchell, 55 catches, 845 yards, 11 touchdowns. Jatavion Sanders, 45 catches, 682 yards, two touchdowns. Why would you draft the third guy on that totem pole in the first round ahead of the other two? Why? And you could say need a tight end. The 49ers obviously don't have a need a tight end. I'm not like criticizing zero line here. A lot of people have just stayed on Sanders in their first round mocks. This isn't anything about his mock whatsoever. But I think we do this often at tight ends, whether it's, you know, Noah Fant, whether it's TJ Hawkinson going top 10. And then those guys don't move the needle in their offense. And it's like, they're still high in tight ends, but they're not actually worth even it when they hit the picks. And, and I think we just have this idea that, oh, Javion Sanders, he's a great prospect. He's going to be a top tight end, top 10 tight end in the NFL. If he's the ninth best tight end in the NFL, you would rather have the 40th best wide receiver because the 40th best wide receiver is going to go for over a thousand yards or you know, like could feasibly go for over a thousand yards this year. Ninth best tight end is going to go for like 700 yards. It's just, they don't move the needle. There's so few that move the needle in the passing game. And the thing is, your line even admits in his write-up, he says, Sanders isn't a great blocker. So you're drafting him over two guys who were objectively better wide receivers for his team last year. And it's not just like for the 49ers, just for any team doing this to then do what for you? I don't know. Uh, that's, that's my tight end soapbox is that so much of their production is schemed and so few times do they move the needle that if you're investing serious draft capital in them, they better produce and they better move like a wide receiver, right? They better, if you just call them a wide receiver, they better still have a first round grade. That's my take on tight ends. I said it before, say it again. I'll keep saying it. Jatavion Sanders, objectively, not a first round grade as a pure wide receiver. Not even a top three ground grade as pure wide receiver. So that was Lance Airlines mock. Very fun doing those. 
going to do a few more during draft season. But next week, I'll be doing my own mock. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday show, my mock. Thursday, Friday show, we're going to tie a bow on the 2023 NFL season, doing the best draft classes and then the worst draft classes. And then the week after that, going to, I believe, get into some combine preview. We'll see. Maybe I'll have a job by then. Who knows? Until then, you've been listening to Render Ranks, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day.